start. There we go, that lovely voice told me we're recording. Welcome to the Athenaeum of Philadelphia to all of our friends and guests who are with us tonight. On screen, you see me, Beth Hessel, the Executive Director, Tess Galen, our Events Coordinator, who makes this all run smoothly, and our guest, special guest tonight, who I will introduce in just a moment. If you are new to the Athenaeum and want to learn more, I invite you to visit our website, www.philaathenaeum.org or come and visit us right here in Washington Square. Our doors are open nine to five almost every day of the business week. We are a community of people who love books, literature, history, art, architecture and conservation, the environment and learning and conversing together. We are a circulating library, a research library and just a fun community to be a part of. We'd love for you to be a part of our community. Before we start and I introduce our, our guest tonight, I um, remind you on the Zoom uh, to get the best uh, experience, you can click on view at the upper right hand corner of your screen as you see the speaker only. And at the bottom of your screen, you should see a Q&A or a chat. Welcome Evo, Jane, by the way, from Boston's Athenaeum. In the chat, you can send us messages like that. What you love most about Venice, where you are, where are you, where you're calling in from tonight for tonight's program or send out kudos to our speaker. If you have questions anytime, you can put them into the q and I'll be paying attention to those. And uh, after the talk, I will moderate the questions. Our guest tonight, it's such a delight, coming from Cornell, relocated to Philadelphia, is Meredith Small. She is a writer and professor emerita from Cornell University, a visiting scholar in the Department of Anthropology at the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, she received her PhD in biological anthropology from UC Davis and spent many years studying macaques, and she has moved her uh, her her work has gone beyond that uh, to being a science journalist with articles appearing in places like Discovered, Natural History, Scientific American, and New Scientist. She's written quite a number of wonderful books, but she's here to talk to us about her most recent one uh, about how Venetians changed the world with all of their discoveries. And I'm, I have no doubt in her talk, she's gonna share with us a bit about how she got into this topic. Uh, I want to invite you all to virtually uh, join me in virtually welcoming Meredith Small to the Athenaeum tonight, and we uh, wish that we had the podium here live for you, but we're so glad you're here. Oh, thank you so much for inviting me to give this talk. It's always, it makes me so happy to be able to talk about Venice in general, but it's really great to do it for the Athenaeum. Uh, you know, what a wonderful place, and it's, here we are on Zoom, but I'm still, you know, I'm in Philadelphia, which is really really great. So I'm going to start the slideshow with my PowerPoints at the at this moment. And I do that play from current slide. There we go. Are we good? Can you see them? Can you see them? No, I'm not seeing. Okay, I think I have to go back and do the share screen, perhaps. Let me do that. On the zoom, I have to do share screen. That's me, share, and then I will, it should, there we go. Perfect. See, okay, great, great. I'm sure that many of you are very familiar with the city of Venice and its history, and you have spent time there, or you might even be Venetian for all I know, but I'm hoping that today's presentation will provide a sort of different view because of course there are a million books about Venice and why another one might be part of the question. And I'm gonna explain that in the first couple of slides because what I did over a period of a couple of years was I compiled a list to my own surprise of over 200 inventions that happened in Venice over its 1600 year history, including modern times. And I wanna tell you how I made this list and how I got to writing this book because it's a very Venetian story in, its, in itself. First, let me say that I'm an anthropologist. I am not a historian and I'm not even a cultural anthropologist. I'm a biological anthropologist who used to study monkeys. 
so this book is quite a pivot for me because I'm going to deep into European history of which I knew absolutely nothing before I started this. Well, how in the world did this happen? Well, uh, as Beth mentioned, besides teaching anthropology, I have a long history of doing science journalism for the popular audience. And those features on those articles always centered along, along the work of other people, uh, mostly scientists. And those decades of writing personal journalism means that I basically know a good story when I see one. I know a hook. And that's really what happened here. But how did I start paying attention to these inventions? Well, it began when I started to attend language school there. I had decided to learn a different language because at least when I was growing up, Americans didn't get different languages in school. And it was just something, a, a hobby for me. So I started at home with the, you know, learn Italian in 10 days kind of books. And then I decided to really go to language school. And um, my daughter and my ex-husband had spent two months at, at, in different years living in Venice. He is an artist. And so we went there for a while after also living in Florence a little bit. And I really liked the city. So I chose um, a school there. And anytime my daughter, who was in high school at that point, went on a, college, or a high school trip, I then went to Venice, 10 days here, a month there, back and forth. Now this school, after um, lectures or you know, work during the day, they would have tours. And one of the teachers would give us the tour, we'd walk around town and speak in Italian. And one day we were at Rialto, which is the bottom picture on the left there, Rialto, near the Rialto market. And the teacher was saying in Italian, Venetians invented government bonds. They invented the first stable currency. They invented letters of credit. And this was all in Italian. And I was thinking, do I understand this correctly? That can't possibly be true. And I kept that in my mind. And then I began to hear inventions all over the place. If you've been to Venice, you know how small the streets are. And you know that when people are walking and talking, you can always overhear them. For me, that meant overhearing them in English most of the time. And one day I was sitting in a bar, as one does all day in Venice, and I was reading a comic book and it's one to the bottom right. It's about um, a thief. So I know the Italian words for thief, robbery, crime, uh, you know, safe. I learned all those. So I was sitting in this bar on the little banquette and the window was open onto a tiny street and I was translating because comic books are actually the language is very good if you're trying to learn a language. So I was translating it and there was a guide outside the window with a couple of American tourists and she started doing the same thing. Venetians invented this, they invented that, they invented this and I began to write around this comic book, write them down. And that's why the first line of my book is, it all began with a comic book and a cocktail, because that's really how it began. So I began, and, and then as I went to museums, on the top middle, you see a pair of sunglasses. There happened to be an exhibit of sunglasses in the Civic Museum. Venetians did not invent glasses, but they invented sunglasses. And then I would go home and I was so interested in Venice, I began to read Venetian history, something which I've never done for any other place. And you see one of Jan Morris's book there about the Venetian empire. And in there, I came across more first. And I, I think of it as the red car theory. You never think about red cars, you buy a red car and all of a sudden you see all the red cars. So all these inventions were really, you know, and then I was actively looking for them, going online, going into the library. And because I'm an academic, I, of course, would take that list and then make sure it was real. Look for at least three references. Some things fell off the list, some things uh, fell on. The result was, don't read this slide. This is not for you to read. It's just to show you the list that I began to make in chronological order of all these inventions. And then what became clear to me what really got to me was that many of these inventions affect the way we operate today. They were familiar. And to me, that was really the hook for the book, that the way we think about things today actually were given to us 
by Venetians. And I knew that was different than any other book that had been written on Venice. And it was an intriguing surprise to me that we owe so many of our modern concepts, ideas, organizations, and objects that we hold dear today. So what to do with that list? I am no historian and I didn't wanna write it in chronological order because I thought it would just be boring. It would be one invention after another. So one day I sat down and I put all the inventions on little slips of paper and I started to put them into piles of categories. And in fact, it worked really well. And those categories became the chapters of the book. So they in include exploration, which is shipbuilding, technology for boats, navigations and maps, ideas for government and community, medicine and public health, consumerism, including both the frivolous and the non-frivolous, money, banks, bonds, and capitalism, the written word, and leisure activities. And I fit them all in. It worked great. Today, I obviously can't present all of these, I think it's 225 inventions. So I'm going to choose, I have chosen just two arenas to talk about after I get through the general introduction. I'm gonna talk about medicine and healthcare because we're all interested in that right now. And also the printed word, because of course, everyone in this audience loves books and loves to read. So I thought those would be the two with uh, the most interest for this audience. So because I'm an anthropologist, what interested me in first, at first was the, ver the big why question, why do humans invent and create? The evolutionary question. <clears throat> and is invention an adaptation that helped humans during their history? And this is actually the first chapter of the book. Invention and creation are clearly human, human universals which means that the, that act is part of who we are as a species. Although other animals also invent and create, they don't do it to the extent and intensity that humans do. So why does it happen? It happens for all different kinds of reasons. There isn't just one reason. First of all, necessity to fix something or solve a problem. And humans have big brains, we're very good at puzzle solving. And so we do that. So that's an obvious one. Humans also love the new. I mean, we love something new. We're always taking something and turning it into something else. So that's another way things get invented. The idea of personal creativity. We think of the arts and crafts, but creativity is also simply creative thinking in general. And that seems to be a compelling part of our large brains as well. Obviously, many inventions are there to make money for the people who invent them. Inventions happen by accident and chance. That happens all the time. And they don't always happen just because of one intellectual genius. It's often a collective. And also inventions build on each other. So you have one invention and then at some point it turns into something else. And that then brought me to the question, but why Venice? Why would this little tiny town, this medieval village basically, be such a hotbed of invention? What in particular fostered that list on the previous slide over so many centuries? Well, I start with a couple of pictures of Venice today. Most people, when they go to Venice, they're focusing on the historical community, but the reality is that Venice is a heritage city, meaning it's still a working city. It is not a ruin. It is not an abandoned and buried place that has later been excavated by archeologists, but it has been continuing from the past to the present, which is one reason it's so very interesting. At its population high, Venice probably had 120,000 people. Now it has about 50,000 permanent residents. And keep in mind that the city is only 2.5 miles wide. So it's a small place where people are densely packed even today. And it is a lively and thriving place to see. If you stay longer than the two days, which is the tourist average, you get to see a very different place. And so these are all my slides. 
And what you see on the far left is sort of an art laboratory where you were near where I was living at that time. You could go in and do some artworks. My favorite picture at the top, when you walk around Venice, you never know what you're gonna see. This is outside a daycare place and you see all the colorful scooters of the little kids. The top right is during a demonstration against the cruise ships, the No Grandi Navi, and you see that's the Venetian, the red flag is the Venetian flag in the middle. At the bottom right is some of the, what I consider fabulous street art. And I just wrote a piece that's up on my website and also on Medium about the fabulous street art of Venice, the graffiti and just the art. And this sentence, ogni tempesta comincia con un singola goccia means every storm begins with a single drop. And I just, you know, I walked through a place and there it was, and I was like, that's awesome. And then in the middle and the bottom is a little community garden in one of, of the campos. So Venice has become one of those must-see cities and it's overrun with about, not in COVID times, although they're all on their way back, 22 million tourists each year. That's 440 tourists for every resident. And I'm gonna talk more about mass tourism at the end. But if you think about it, if we take Philadelphia's population, the city population of 1. million, and do the same math, it would mean 660 million tourists each year, but we only get 46 million. So that's the difference. But again, if people stay longer, you get something different. The people walking really fast and asking you and saying permesso, permesso, excusa, are to get you out of the way, those are Venetians. The people standing around talking to each other, those are Venetians. The people filling most of the bars, standing there talking to each other, they are Venetians. And here you see um, on the left was near my apartment at that point, that's the wall of the Arsenale. And I just loved all the black laundry hanging up. My favorite pizza, takeout pizza place, be careful of the seagulls. I have to bring my daughter pizza home when I fly back home. And also just some little street scenes, including the um, not climate change as the water, the sign of the water rising. These people continue to live without cars in a place where daily life takes on an edge of difference from other cities on the mainland. And Venetians take great pride in that because they do this in the midst of all that historical, architectural, and artistic beauty. On the left is one of my fav favorite buildings, the Bovolo, which means the snail, an outside staircase. The middle picture near the Arsenale, my sister, when I sent it to her, she said, where is that special bridge in Venice? I said, it's just one of 144 bridges, it's not special. And then just a little corner down here on the right, everywhere you look, there is something beautiful. So what makes Venice unique is not just its age and its beauty, but it's also its history of community and government. And in that, we begin to see why invention was so common. So a little bit of history here about the Venetian Republic. Venice was never a city state such as Mantua, Ferrara, Pisa, Florence, and all the rest. It was always an amalgam of island communities. From the very first, when the scattered people of the lagoon decided to collaborate and form some sort of government, they had to accommodate many separate island communities. So the first government was built as a series of committees. And throughout its 1100 years as an independent republic, Venice was run by committees. The physical seat of the government historically changed over time, but ended up in the central group of islands that we now call Venice. But those, it's also a whole bunch of little islands connected by bridges. And that's where the government finally ended up. At first, everyone in town was part of the government. I should say all the men in town were part of the government and they met together. But in 1297, that began to change as the so-called nobility started to sequester power and oust those who could not call themselves nobles. And keep in mind that these nobles were not people who had titles, they didn't have land handed down, they were a different breed of nobles. They were just 
working merchants, rich merchants, uh, but they did take control of the government. Venice was not a democracy per se, but it was always a republic and remains the longest standing republic in the world. And a fact that the Venetians hold dear. Um, as an American woman who had retired to Venice because her husband was Venetian said to me one day, it has always and always be the Venetian Republic. And my Italian teacher who's in Milan comes from Puglia, uh, who I talked to twice a week, went to Venice recently, he's 23. Last, he was only been there once when he was a kid, when he was 12, he was there for 24 hours. And he said to me, my heart is now in Venice. Uh, he fell in love with the city. And he also said to me, Venice is not Italy. And I, I knew exactly what he meant. It is so different. <clears throat> anyway, with the nobles in charge, the government became an oligarchy, meaning run by a small group of nobles. But interestingly enough, these nobles and their committees continued to have the interest of all the citizens in mind. And that's a very important point. And why did that happen? It has to do with the Venetian economy. That is the economics of international trade and what it, what it take, took to make that successful on such a small collective of people and small islands. Venetian nobles, as I said, were working men. They were Venetian, they were merchant traders. They were the financiers of the ships that went out to gather trade goods. They owned the warehouses that held the goods and passed them along trade routes by river and land to the rest of Europe. And they needed all the other citizens to run their business, to sail the ships, to load and unload, to keep track of the goods. And they had a giant network that took this enormous layer and knowledge and moved it up into Europe and all across the Levant. Think of, of the, the Shakespeare's The Merchant of Venice. That's exactly what it's about, that he has financed these, bo these boats and they're not returning and he may be ruined. The city was and is so small and dense that these nobles ran into their workers every day. They were not sequestered off the way they are often say in gated communities or castles or palaces. They were really part of the fabric of the city. And the next level, de social, uh, level down of the social hierarchy called cittadini, they had their confraternities, their guilds, churches and distinct neighborhoods that connected everybody. So the city was a collective of collectives which inspired interpersonal interaction and invention and a government that cared about its citizens which also produced various inventions and initiatives uh, for the city. This is my theory, anyway. Also, another element that contributed to the inventions and creative ideas was the fact that the Venetian Republic had an antagonistic relationship with the Vatican. Yes, there are a million churches, Catholic churches in Venice even now, but those churches function not just as places of worship, but also as social anchors for neighborhoods, a place where people gathered and got their identity. But the Pope was unable to do much with Venetians because when he tried, they just ignored him. They were in the middle of the lagoon. Nobody could really get to them. So Venice had a sense of personal freedom combined with community interactions and a government that was watching out. And that's a very unusual combination. I believe that Venice was a place where creativity flourished because it was geographically small and densely populated like a beehive. It wasn't constrained by the church. The government paid attention to the populace and everybody was working cooperatively to make money. So now I wanna talk about medicine, public health and healthcare. Maybe everybody already knows this because it's gotten a lot of press in the last 15 months, but Venetians invented quarantine and they did so on March 20th in 1348. In the face of the plague, the first quarantine ever was initiated by law by the government of Venice. It began with telling ships, foreign ships, that they had to anchor in the lagoon for 30 days 
And then in 1403, that time at anchor was up to 40 days. Quaranta means 40 days in Veneziano, the language of Venice, and also in Italian. And that's why we are all using the Venetian word quarantine. I might also just put in here, ciao is also a Ven Veneziano word. It's an alluded two words, ci schiavo, which means I will, I, I will be your servant, I will serve you, and it's ciao. So it's Veneziano. So, you know, you're all speaking Venetian. Okay. So they did this with no real knowledge of viruses and bacteria and contagion, but just with common sense. After ships came from afar, plague broke out. And so let's keep them away for a while and see what happens. Because it worked, it, it kept the death rate down, although it didn't end any plague. Venetians were also the first to put groups of people in quarantine away from their homes. And after all, they had so many isolated islands in the lagoon, it wasn't much of a leap to use them in this public health measure to protect the city. So again, geography initiated invention. The first plague island, or Lazaretto, as it's called, now called Lazaretto Vecchio, which means old Lazaretto, was built in 1423, and you see it on the left there. You can go visit. It's only open in September on the weekends, and you have to get yourself over to the Lido, and they have a little boat there. So if you have a chance, uh, it, it's a fabulous place to go visit, incredibly beautiful. The idea was to keep people who had signs of plague or had been exposed to plague away from the healthy. So they started out with foreign visitors coming into port, but eventually they included Venetians in the system as well. And you see in the middle engraving, boats coming and dropping people off. And on the right, that's a picture I took, and that is the inside uh, that has been restored. So these ships no longer sat in the lagoon and everything, oh, excuse me. And then they uh, opened another one, a Lazaretto Nuovo, which means new Lazaretto, which is on the Northeast of Venice. And that was in 1468. The purpose of that was to forget about the ships and download everything that was on the ships and put them onto that Lazaretto. They also then in turn citizens of Venice who had been exposed and they were made to go to Lazaretto Nuovo with all their goods. Their goods were fumigated uh, with things like herbs and berries and things. And people were housed in really nice compounds. Everyone from one ship was kept together and they had a garden and they had a communal chapel. They had to stay there for 40 days. A doctor checked them every day. And if they shot, showed signs of plague, they were transported over to Lazaretto Vecchio. If not, after 40 days, they could proceed to Venice. You can also go visit Lazaretto Nuovo uh, during the summer. And you just have to make sure if you go on the public water bus, the Vaporetto, you tell them that's where you're going and they will then dock and let you off. And it's also a great tour to go there. Keep in mind, there was no theory of contagion at that point. So they were operating in a microbial dark on this, but it was a very good guess. There is a third plague island, which is actually two islands that have been uh, that were connected together called Povilia. Um, I've only been there once. It is abandoned at this point. It was used uh, as a checkpoint for incoming people in 1776, then for disease containment, and later it was used as a mental as uh, asylum. Povilia also had a thriving community until 1968, and it is now abandoned and waiting for some sort of great plan to revive it. Uh, it was up for sale for $8 million, but I, someone bought it. So we'll see what they come up with. The first official Department of Public Health in the world was invented in Venice in 1485. It was called the Magistrato alla Sanità. It, is a it was a government agency in charge of a long list of communal issues, including managing quarantine, making sure every citizen had clean water, removal of the dead, which was of course horrendous during the plague. They cleaned up the garbage, which they still do, watched over the sewers. They had oversight of physicians and barbers who practice um, uh, medicine. They dealt with mental health and they had control of the plague, smallpox and venereal disease. 
uh, that Magistrato Ala Sanita is the very model of a public health agency that we have today. It's exactly the same. And now I'm gonna take you on a little trip to Padua. Those of you who have been in Venice probably know that Padua is a city, 30 minute train ride on the mainland west of Venice. And it was part of the Venetian Republic starting in 1405 and lasting for 400 years. It was the University of Padua was considered at that time the University of Venice. And some say the government wanted those academics outside the city and were happy to financially support Padua to keep them uh, from afar. The University of Padua is old and famous. It was established in 1222 when a group broke off from the University of Bologna because they wanted even more academic freedom making Padua the second oldest university in Italy and the fifth oldest in the world. It's the place where Galileo and many others worked and taught. Copernicus was there for a while, etc. It is and was an intellectual as well as a practical place. I have a British friend who's going there right now getting a master's in foreign affairs or something. And back then, Padua was, was famous for training doctors and anatomists. And in that, they changed the very face of medicine. And you will recognize a lot of this. For example, the father of human anatomy, Andreas Vesalius, studied anatomy at Padua, and he was a professor there. The medical faculty at Padua was dedicated to the act of dissection, which showed that disease was caused by organ failure, not miasma or the humors. They were the first to figure that out. In 1595, they built the oldest permanent anatomy theater in the world, and this is a picture of it. Uh, I recommend go to Padua, go to Palazzo Bo, which is the center of the university, and take the guided tour, and you will get to walk in to this anatomy theater. It has uh, six tiers, and the story goes that when it was first opened, because of course there was no electricity, so there were torches, and it didn't smell so great. And so they had a string quartet on the sixth stage so that it would make it more pleasant for everyone. People always think, ah, this is the theater where they had the table that flipped and the bot because they weren't allowed to do a dissections because of the Catholic church and the bodies went into a canal. Well, there are parts of that is correct. They do have a flipping table at the bottom. But at the time, there were legal and illegal dissection. They had made a deal with the Catholic Church of Padua, and they were allowed to do, I think, five dissections a month, but they wanted to do more. So they sent their medical students out into graveyards to rob them and bring bodies back. And so if someone happened to walk in, some official, they did flip the table, but there's no water under, <laughs> under this part of Padua. So there's just a hole in the ground and then they would retrieve the body again. So from the physicians and anatomists at Padua, well, we get things like this. The first accurate description of the heart, the iris, pulmonary circulation, the inner ear, the clitoris, fallopian tubes, and the fact that the sternum was one bone rather than two, among other discoveries. We've also gained from the faculty uh, at Padua, things like the heart rate monitor, which was made out of a ruler, a silk cord, and a ball of lead. This was the first precision instrument of human wellness and the first medical measuring device in history. They also invented the thermometer, and by they, I mean Galileo and a, a physician and anatomist named Santorio Santorio. Galileo and others were working on the thermometer. He came up with a good model, and Santorio is the person who put the numbers on it. So the thermometers we use today to check our COVID status were invented by Venetians, except for Galileo wasn't officially Venetian, but he worked there for, I think, 20 years, 25 years, something like that. Um, Santorio Santorio is, is one of my favorites. When you go on the tour, you hear a lot about him. He invented the body scale, the first body scale, not quite like the one you have in your bathroom. What it looks like, and they have a model at Padua, it looks like a bed hanging from ropes. 
And what Santorio did, he was very interested in how the body worked. So every day after he invented this body scale, he weighed himself. Then he weighed everything he ate and drank. And he then weighed what his body lost in urine and feces. And he charted it all for 30 years. And this was the invention of the concept of metabolism. He invented it. The germ theory of contagion was not invented by Louis Pasteur, but instead by a, a, a physician named Girolamo Fracastoro. He had the idea that these things he called fomites as particles that passed along disease. And he thought he wrote about this in 1546. Fracastoro also invented the first clinical trial, the first, and that was, he was a specialist in syphilis and his um, hypothesis, his trial was about condoms. Do condoms prevent syphilis? And he did, he, he did this study and found out that they did. So we owe that to him as well. Medical practice. Padawans initiated the change to medical practice that are still with us. And they include the first time students were required to visit and touch their patients. And that was in 1539 because everything was miasma, you know, so you didn't have to touch anybody. They were also required to write down what was going on with their pa patient. And that was the invention of the patient chart. They also invented evidence-based medicine as they were moving away from the humors and miasma to science. So this is the beginning of the scientific revolution and it was going on in Padua as well. Uh, one of these physicians invented occupational medicine back then. The first pediatric, pediatrics was practiced there and the first pediatric textbook was printed in Venice. Also modern pathology and they believed that in, you could inherit diseases and that was called constitutional medicine back then, what we call human genetics. Now the printed word, switch a little bit here. Obviously Venetians did not invent the printing press, but a printing press was brought to Venice in 1469 by a German named Johannes de Spira and he received a patent. And let me just say here, Venice also invented patents in 1474. They invented patents and patent law. Another reason invention worked really well because the government gave patents and if you were an inventor, you were protected for 10 years. The printing business in Venice exploded as printers and would-be printers came to the city from all over. This slide in the middle of the printing evolution was an exhibit in 2018 at the Cora Museum. And it was absolutely just so wonderful. It's a group from Oxford who are tracing the printed book in Venice from 1450 to 1500 when the printing revolution happened. Um, they have, they were able to collect 500 books from that time from libraries and private collections, and then to trace those books from printer to consumer because of the bookkeeping that Venetian printers and publishers had. So they have these books, ledgers, that show where these particular books went and they could trace them. And the final chart looks like a, a study of genetics. Of, it's like they were watching DNA go through generations. Really fabulous work. And the exhibit showed the extent of this very successful and famous Venetian book business when there were just about 200 printers in Venice. But again, why Venice? First of all, they had freedom of the press. Nobody cared what you wrote for a while. There was no interference from the church. Church couldn't tell them what to do. There was no censorship at first until the Inquisition came in a sort of weak form in 1516. There was available financing. It used to be if you were wanted a book, you had to be a rich person, you would then get a printer to print it and it was only for you. But they had all these rich nobles who were willing to finance a series of printing. They also probably most importantly had easy access to paper because they could float timber down from around the Alps and they owned all that land, the Venetian Republic owned it so they could bring paper in or make paper. They had a literate population, uh, pretty much everybody in Venice could read and they had a group of intellectuals that were interested. 
and also extremely important, the Venetian merchants already had that tried and true distribution network across Europe and even farther. So this was an, an efficient method for distributing books and a major contributing uh, contributor to their success. In that, Venice also invented the active book market. They were able to target consumers because they had agents in all these different ports and they told the agents to ask consumers, what would you like to read? And interestingly enough, in the exhibit, they had a list of what were bestsellers and what weren't, like health books or self-help books or travel books, very interesting. And also the Venetian work was by and large artistic and beautiful and their books were nicely designed to make reading very inviting for people. So they invented the book copyright intellectual property law 1486. The birth of the publishing business happened there. So instead of printing for one person, now these printers became a business for the masses. They invented various typefaces and Venetians were the first to apply page numbers to books. They invented or printed the genres of punctuation, travel, daily diary, memoir, eating for health, self-help, manners, architecture, and medicine. And I must say those are the first in all those categories were printed in Venice. It is also of note that Venetians invented newspapers. They're called uh, visi. They were little printed folded things that the government felt it wasn't communicating well enough. So they had these little folded papers that were then distributed around town. And if you go to Venice today and you're taking a public water bus, the bulletin board that has uh, notices is called the avisi in the same way. So you hear from the government what's happening with public transportation. I need to mention the special note of one publisher that probably many of you have heard of, and that's Aldus Minutius. He was not Venetian, but he came to Venice to become a printer. And he's probably the best known uh, Renaissance printer in the world. And he completely changed the face of the public, uh, published book. He invented the period, the comma, the colon, and the semicolon because the lines of non-printed book of handwritten manuscripts had no punctuation because they were meant to be read out loud and the reader was then making those kinds of changes. But he wanted books to be easy to read for the individual reader, so he invented punctuation. He also invented the paperback book and by doing that, he invented reading for pleasure. This, these books were small, they're red. You sometimes see them in Renaissance paintings. Somebody's holding up a little red book. They were portable, they were reasonably inexpensive, but not that inexpensive. He was the first to use a colophon, a publisher's mark, which in his case was the anchor and the dolphin now used by Aldine Press, which is, his was also Aldine Press, but it's not the one we know of today. He also by mistake invented the first time there was a blank first page in a book, uh, and that was a mistake. He had a stack that was gonna be printed of a book and he'd put a piece of paper there. The printers came in at night and they did it. And then they just went, oh, well, we'll just do that. He invented the book catalog, a list of his available books with the incredible um, jeweler, Francesco Griffo, they invented italic font and they wanted to mimic handwriting again so that people would be more comfortable reading a printed book because it would look like it was rented by hand. So italics come from Venice. He and others printed books in Hebrew, Arabic, and Greek and other languages, which required changes in typography to get all the diacritics in place. And they did that. Griffo did a lot of that work. Without this history, I could not have published this book for a general audience. And my publisher, Pegasus Books, was quite charmed to read from me that their very business was invented in Venice. And now I want to talk about Venice today because you, you just simply cannot write a book about Venice without addressing their, their double crises today of climate change and mass tourism, the two things which are fatally damaging the infrastructure and the functioning of the city. Now, as an anthropologist, I know that cities do die and maybe we don't care about this one, but what if we do? 
whose responsibility is it to save Venice? Is it Venetians? Is it Italians? Is it the international community? And also, we're all aware that this is happening not just in Venice, but other places. If you've seen the articles recently about Miami in the New York Times, and what is Miami going to do because the water is coming. So the idea here is to address some of these things in Venice and use it as an example. Um, so let's start with climate change. I, I have been in many aqua altas that come and go with the tide, especially in the fall. But the fall of 2019 was unbelievable to me. I was basically stuck inside for five days. It was the first time I got cold water come up over my very high fishing boots and down into my feet. And it was the first time when I left the house, I could not find coffee, which is remarkable in Venice because everything was saved. Well, that's my doorbell, we'll ignore it. Okay, uh, this happens, Aqua ha Alta happens with a, a very strange combination. It's runoff from the rivers that come from the Alps combined with rainfall, combined with the Bora wind that pushes water up into, up around the Adriatic and down into the three outlets that run into the lagoon. And you see them on the left side. There are three outlets that the Adriatic can then push in. They have these, uh, they have built, it's taken 20 years, these mosaic gates, which you see the two pictures of them. And they did not operate due to faulty work and corruption. And it's been a huge scandal in Venice. But in the fall of 2019, the woman who's in charge of them said, these gates will work by 2021. And everybody went, yeah, right. And in fact, last fall, they worked. She made it happen. And they work well. Most people don't realize that the, the Aqua Alta comes with the tide. So it's twice a day, the gates have to go up. The concern is how, with those gates going up and down, will they change the natural ecology of the lagoon? A lagoon is a different kind of body of water. It is very shallow. On average, it's five feet deep. And it's in the edges where they call the dead lagoon. It is, you can just walk around in it. You can see the bottom most of the time. So it is a very fragile kind of place. And so we'll see what happens with that. There is also, um, I think the real hope about Venice is something that's being called reimagining Venice. And during this time of COVID, this has really gained traction. And I'm at the moment, I'm writing a book proposal about a medieval map, uh, written, uh, the oldest medieval map in the world that hangs in the library in Venice. But at the same time, I'm beginning to work on a book about the future of Venice. Everybody writes about the history. I wanna use it almost in an anthropological sense of an example of what could happen going forward. And you know, it's also just an excuse to be in Venice, but there we are. So there is a growing movement to reimagine Venice. And these are basically grassroots um, organizations. At the moment, the streets and canals are clean and it's easy to walk around. And I keep getting videos from my friends of dolphins in the lagoon and sharks in the lagoon. And it's pretty wonderful. But Venice made a mistake. They became what an anthropology is called a one crop culture, meaning that when a culture depends on one crop, be it rice or sorghum or whatever, when that crop fails, the village fails. And this is now economically what has happened to Venice. It is now a one crop town based on tourism wrapped within an ecological disaster of global climate change. Tourism at this scale is not just unpleasant. Look at the slide in the middle. How would you like to be walking in that? But it's damaging. And quite frankly, I don't know why anyone would want to be a tourist in this. Um, the daily cleanup, they do sweep every single street in Venice every day. It is extensive, the cost of the cleanup. There is also a lot of drunkenness and a lot of just garbage and people leaving their stuff. And it is painful uh, all the time. And basically, I don't go to Venice in the summer because of that. 
a lot of people just come to party. I have been subjected to some of that. And this is really not a city for partying. It actually closes down at eight o'clock at night and there's only one club and I've heard it's pretty lousy. So it's really not for that. So these are some of the ideas that I've learned about um, from my friend and professor Shao Basi at Ka Foskari, which is the University of Venice now. And he now has a program about social science and humanities, and it's about sustainability. And I heard a great talk he gave, but anyway. So the first is how to stop mass tourism. Well, the first issue of course is the cruise ships. When the cruise ships dock at the area called Santa Marta on the west end of Venice, the pollution is enormous. There can be eight of them there at the same time. And if you don't know, they can be 14 stories high and carry up to 8,000 people. It hurts the infrastructure, but the people in Santa Marta now have to keep their windows closed at all times because the pollution is so horrible and the engines run constantly. They don't turn them off. So when the cruise ships disgorge two, three, six, eight thousand 8,000 people, they come through the city. Um, they are certainly the liners are paying um, taxes, docking taxes, but that money does not go to the city of Venice. It actually goes to Mestre on land. That's where the governmental heart of the Veneto is. The mayor of Venice is actually from Mestre. And so Venice itself hardly gets anything from this. The cruise ship people eat on the ships, they sleep on the ships, they maybe buy a cheap mask, they get back on the ships. But it's also, if you've seen the pictures in the paper, visually seeing one of these ships that it, they are taller than anything in Venice is shocking. And again, I don't get it. I don't know why anybody would want to do that. So during this winter, the government of Italy said no more cruise ship, you know, no, they will not pass. San Marco. Well, two days ago, one of them came in because they still had a contract standing. And so they still came in and did the same thing. There are various ideas that there is now a law, they are not going to be allowed, but what do they do with them? So there's one idea to bring them in. They have to redig a lower canal, park the, the boats at the mainland. They still have to ferry people over, maybe on the Lido, maybe at Trieste, maybe at Ravenna. Who knows what's going to happen? it's not gonna happen fast because they have to build the infrastructure for these cruise boats. But as that one uh, left yesterday, of course, the protesters were all out there in their boats, the No Grandi Navi. Um, and personally, I've been in a couple of those demonstrations. It's, it's just, it isn't right. It, and even my friend, uh, my teacher Stefano said, he had never thought about the cruise ships before. He's from Southern Italy. And he had actually been on one himself when he was 12 with his parents. And he noticed that they were kind of scary near the land. But he said, now that he's been to Venice, he cannot imagine those cruise ships there. And I said to him, he goes, where do they go? I said, right by San Marco. And he just said, it cannot be, you cannot do that. So there's gotta be some will there to change that. I'm not sure what it is. Now, here are some more, um, uh, there is also, there was, they were going to start charging a fee for day people coming into Piazza San Marco. I think that has not been in place because of COVID. So maybe next year people, and this happens in other cities where you're charged a fee to get into the historic center. Venice is all pretty much historic center, but if they, there are ways to mark off uh, Piazza San Marco and charge people uh, a fee to do that. But the ideas that I think for the future that are, are really intriguing is the first one, uh, sent, make it even more so a center for the arts. There are the Biennales of Art, Dance and Architecture and Literature. And Venice also has its very lively art scene. And that's a print on the top that I have hanging in, in the way Venice is built. It's actually uh, built on timber. And so that's a really a nice print. I have, I have lots of prints in my house like that. You can go to a concert, an art exhibit, a film or a lecture every day of the week in Venice. And, and there are posters all over time about this. So the idea of making it more, even more so a city for the arts is great. 
There are ideas about revising the cityscape, putting a, a luxury yacht marina in that air, kicking out the cruise ships, putting it in the luxury uh, marina where you'd get few boats, smaller boats with rich people in them who would then spend more money. My personal favorite and the one that I'm getting sort of involved with is that there is a huge movement to make Venice a city for sustainability education. And this is happening both at Ca' Foscari we're at the Center for Humanities and Social Change. They now have a master's program. I've hooked up people from uh, St. Joe's and Villanova with this program, and hopefully there'll be some exchange of students and that kind of stuff. Also the I International University uh, of Venice, which is an architecture and design university, uh, they are now about sustainability. And so if someone wants a degree in sustainability and design, that's the place to go. Most tourists don't realize that Venice is really a college town. There are in fact three universities there, including an international university on the island of San Servolo. They also would like to attract those who work remotely uh, but they're going to have to make the rents a lot cheaper for that to happen. The Salone Nautica at the bottom is the luxury uh, yacht thing. So there are political difficulties with Mestre and with Venice and them seeing a, as a treasure chest. But there probably is, I just got contacted yesterday to become involved in one of these sustainability places in the future of Venice, and I will do that. They're looking for people to write about Venice who are Venetians and also people outside of Venice, which are called Foresti, um, to write. And, and so hopefully I can be involved in that. What prova means is test, or it means he or she tries. And yes, those are my feet. Uh, and I really like to slide because I believe that anything can happen in Venice with this incredibly rich history and that Venetians are so very dedicated to their city. When I have conversations, which I do all over town, so often the conversation begins with the other person saying, sono veneziana, I am Venetian. And then they say something. So the pride is there. And maybe they can transform from a one crop economy, not get rid of tourism, just make it less and go to a different approach. So thank you all for listening. I'm happy to answer any questions if I can. Thank you, Mary. This is interesting as uh, uh, Richard pointed out, um, Philadelphia's quarantine station on the Delaware south of the airport uh, was Lazaretto. recently restored and it's called the Lazaretto. And he said he That's didn't right. know the connection to Venetian history. Yeah. Um, Margaret shares that she uh, had worked in a hospital uh, in, in Venice and she finds it interesting. Uh, it was small and everyone was related to each other. <laughs> yeah. uh, so the hospital was like the one in the TV program MASH, you know, the, the, the army. <laughs> she said, you never forgot anything and every idea was followed up as you met each other virtually every day and reminded one another. Um, I think it's very, very fun. Yeah. Um, a question here. Uh, and, and please put your questions in the Q&A. We have time for, for two or three. So if you've got something here, um, I'm, uh, I'm curious, the, uh, the Lazarettos that were built, were those actually islands that were already out there or did they have to create firms to put them on? No, um, uh, many of the islands, there, there aren't islands, well, there are now, uh, there's one island that was made out of landfill, but you, there are, I think about 30 islands in the lagoon and 15 of them are occupied. And they were always messing around with them. They were always adding line landfill right from the beginning. But the ones that became the Lazarettos, and I didn't talk about the mental health one, which is also there, uh, which is great, San Servolo, um, they fiddled with them, but the islands were already there. They were all there. And of all, all the things that you discovered as, as you wrote your book, whether you talked about them in, in tonight's talk or they're just in your book, what was your, uh, what, what discovery uh, did you find most interesting uh, of all the inventions? Well, I really loved the, all the publishing stuff, the, 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 the italics and punctuation. I mean, I had no idea that it was like that. And, um, there, there are other ones. I mean, the first casino is in Venice, public casino was in Venice and it's still there. And so I was able to go in and go up into it. Uh, and uh, I would try to track things down all the time. I mean, there's stuff like scented soap 
that was invented there. And I know, and the, the hmm. streets are often named after what was made there. So I actually lived on the street of the scented soap makers for a while. So for me, if I'd get an invention and then if there was some connection to exactly what was going on for me right then, it just brought it all home. Uh, you know, they, they invented, you know that white makeup that Queen, Queen Elizabeth I wore? They had the best in the world. They didn't invent it, but they had the best. And of course it was full of lead and it killed people. You know, so those little mistakes, you know, things like that. <laughs> the uh, uh, Commedia dell'arte, you know, Punch and Judy, those were invented. Uh, the first public opera house, which they're now trying to rebuild. There's a big uh, fundraising thing going on. They want to build it from scratch. So uh, I love that kind of energy as well, that they want to bring things back. That is wonderful. I think a lot of people agree with uh, Andrea, who said wanted to thank you for a fascinating program. She's this past midnight in the UK, but we're staying up for it. And she's looking forward to reading your book, as I, I am sure many of you are. And um, I'm thinking, Tess, you probably have a, a slide you can put up to show people where um, where we can find the book at bookshop.org. And also, if somebody wants me to sign it, I'm happy to do that. Um, I'm easy to find, ms32 at cornell.edu. And if you live in Philadelphia, I can do that. And if you don't live in Philadelphia, I actually have postcards of, of the book and I can sign the postcard and mail you one if, if you want those, you know, I don't care. People always say, will you sign my book like it's a favor? I gotta tell you, authors live for that. So if <laughs> I have Anthony uh, uh, through you guys and you're holding it for somebody and they want it, you know, if, if they, if you have it and they want it signed, I can come in and do that. Well, thank you. So Tess put, uh, if, you, if you look in the, um, in the chat, uh, Emeritus, uh, uh, her, her email address, ms32, ms32 at cornell.edu. If you want her to sign, sign the book or send you a postcard that's been signed that you can put in the book. And bookshop.org is a, uh, uh, a distributor of, of books that they support independent bookstores, a portion of their funds go back to independent bookstores, a portion will come to the Athenaeum if you purchase the book uh, through this uh, uh, through this site. We also have a copy available at the Athenaeum if you're a member and want to come and check it out at the library um, and take a look at it also. We are, are so grateful for you to uh, for, for joining us, Meredith. Florence says, thank you, excellent talk. Uh, Eva Jane for giving her an entirely new way of looking at Venice. Uh, I think we all uh, agree this is just wonderful. Thank you so much. Uh, everybody can again virtually <laughs> join me in thanking Meredith and we look forward to seeing you uh, at, in person at the Athenaeum in, uh, in coming times and oh. wish everyone a Wish everyone a wonderful evening. Uh, if you want to find out more, we still have, I think, four more programs coming up in our season before we take a little hiatus. Uh, besides our, our noon programs, we'll continue through the summer. On Thursday, Tyrone McKinley Freeman in conversation with Reverend Mark Tyler of uh, uh, Mother Bethel AME about Madam C.J. Walker's gospel of giving, Think, talking about that makeup, uh, Madam C.J. Walker, uh, Philadelphia, and who built her fortune uh, in a makeup empire. and. Um, and, and was an incredible philanthropist. Uh, Laura Forsberg talk, continued our, our sort of uh, a global look at the world, worlds beyond miniatures and Victorian fiction. And here from Philadelphia, a conversation with Ty Wynn of the Community Design Collaborative about that community and the work that they are doing. If you're interested in architecture and uh, design and development, please join us for that conversation as well. We are so grateful for everyone who joined us this night tonight from Philadelphia, Boston, New York, UK, and everywhere else. And we look forward to seeing you again soon. And thank you again, Meredith. Wish everybody a wonderful evening. Go get yourself an Aperol Spritz and have a <laughs> wonderful, wonderful evening sharing with whoever was not on this, uh, this program tonight, everything you've learned about what the Venetians invented. Okay, bye. Bye. <laughs>